Delirium is an acute state of confusion and cognitive impairment in someone who is medically unwell. By definition, delirium is not a primary psychiatric disorder, but rather is a psychiatric manifestation of another underlying condition, such as a medical disease or exposure to specific substances. While the conditions that cause delirium are not necessarily psychiatric in origin, psychiatrists are often consulted on delirium given their specialty in evaluating mental status. However, any doctor or medical care provider needs to be knowledgeable about delirium, especially those who work in acute care settings like the hospital or emergency room. More than just making the patient confused, delirium has been found to be an independent predictor of multiple negative outcomes, including slower recovery from illness and a higher rate of death. Because of this, assessing for and treating delirium promptly is crucial. You can remember the key clinical features of delirium using the phrase, where the F am I? First, the where in this mnemonic should remind you of the disorientation that occurs in delirium. This confusion is often a result of the changes in both memory and attention, which are seen in all cases of delirium. Memory is what keeps someone anchored to their past, while attention is what keeps them oriented to the present. When these two processes are impaired, it becomes increasingly difficult for the patient to maintain a coherent sense of self, place, time, and purpose. Asking these four orientation questions can help to determine the severity of a patient's confusion, as their ability to answer these questions is generally lost in reverse order, with people first losing track of why they're in the hospital or clinic, then what the date is, then where they are, and finally even what their name is. Next, T is for thought disorganization. In addition to the memory and attention problems already described, patients with delirium also experience a general clouding of consciousness that manifests in disorganized thoughts. Patients will often say things that don't make any sense or will respond to a command by doing something entirely unrelated, such as spitting when asked to raise their hand. In more severe forms of delirium, the ability to speak and comprehend language can be lost entirely. Next, H is for hallucinations. Delirium can cause major disruptions in one's perception, with hallucinations being common. These hallucinations are generally visual in nature, and patients can sometimes be seen responding to internal stimuli by looking around the room at objects that aren't there. The visual nature of hallucinations and delirium stands in stark contrast to the auditory hallucinations seen in schizophrenia and other psychiatric conditions. Because delirium is most often caused by a medical, rather than psychiatric problem, you can remember this by thinking that visual hallucinations are more likely to come from diseases of the viscera. Next, E is for energy changes. Delirium can have drastic effects on a patient's level of energy and activity. Some patients become hyperactive with restlessness, babbling, and even agitation, which tends to get the treatment team's attention. In contrast, hypoactive forms of delirium, in which a patient instead becomes slow, sleepy, and apathetic, are much more likely to go under-recognized. Nevertheless, even hypoactive forms of delirium can be problematic, as they are still associated with all the same poor outcomes that hyperactive delirium is. Disturbance of the sleep-wake cycle is common in both forms of delirium as well, with many patients being awake all night and then sleeping during the day. Next, F is for fluctuating. Delirium is classically described as having a waxing and waning course, with moments of lucidity alternating with periods of confusion. It's not uncommon for someone with delirium to be fully oriented at lunch, then be actively hallucinating and unable to remember their own name by dinner time. This waxing and waning pattern is so highly suggestive of delirium that it can be diagnostic in many cases, as it helps to rule out something like dementia, where the state of confusion is more often stable and enduring. Next, A is for acute. Delirium is an acute condition, meaning that it both comes on quickly, often over the span of only a few hours or days, and also tends to be transient, with most patients getting better over time provided that the underlying causes are addressed. While this is a helpful rule of thumb, it is not 100%, as it is increasingly recognized that persistent cognitive deficits can occur, especially in cases of prolonged illness. Finally, the M and the I stand for medical causes and intoxicants. As mentioned earlier, delirium is caused by an underlying condition such as medical disease or exposure to specific substances. Use the mnemonic pinch me to remember the most common precipitants of delirium, including poorly controlled pain, infections like pneumonia or UTIs, nutrition, including poor food intake and various vitamin deficiencies, constipation, which is a common but often under-recognized trigger for delirium, poor hydration, especially if this leads to electrolyte imbalances or hypoperfusion of tissues, medications and recreational substances, with both prescription and illicit drugs having the potential to trigger delirium, 
and finally endocrine disorders like uncontrolled diabetes or thyroid disease. Delirium is common in hospitalized patients, with anywhere from 10 to 30% of all patients in the hospital experiencing some form of delirium. It is even more common in those parts of the hospital with the sickest patients, such as the intensive care unit where rates of delirium approach 50 to 75%. Older age is a major risk factor for delirium, especially if the patient has pre-existing cognitive impairments such as dementia. Men seem to be more vulnerable to delirium than women, with some estimates placing a gender ratio of around 2 to 1. Delirium is self-limiting in most cases, with the majority of patients recovering once the underlying cause is addressed. The average duration of delirium in a hospitalized patient is around one week, although cases of prolonged delirium lasting weeks or even months have been noted. However, while the prognosis of delirium itself is good, the prognosis of the patient is often worse, with multiple studies showing that delirium is an independent predictor of longer hospital lengths of stay post-hospital institutionalization, worse functional outcomes after discharge, and even a higher rate of mortality within the next year. Treatment of delirium should be multimodal, including medical, psychiatric, social, and environmental interventions. Use the mnemonic, you are safe, to remember the key strategies for treating delirium. First, U is for underlying cause. Recognition of delirium should initiate an immediate workup to determine a primary cause. Once a cause is found, treatment should be started, such as using antibiotics to treat an underlying infection. Given the role that medications can play in precipitating delirium, you should always do a close review of the patient's medication list to look for and remove any potentially deliriogenic drugs. With benzodiazepines, opioids, steroids, and anticholinergics like diphenhydramine or Benadryl being common culprits. Close attention should also be paid to recreational substances, with alcohol in particular being highly deliriogenic in states of both intoxication and withdrawal. Next, R is for reorientation. Gently orienting the patient when they become confused, such as by reminding them of where they are or why they're in the hospital, can be helpful as long as it is not done excessively or in a way that provokes agitation. Next, S is for sleep. The disturbed sleep-wake cycle seen in delirium may itself hinder immune system function and the body's overall ability to heal. For that reason, efforts to promote healthy sleep patterns, such as turning off the lights at night and minimizing unnecessary beeping, alarms, and other disruptive noises, can help to promote recovery. Next, A is for antipsychotics. Antipsychotic medication can reduce the severity and duration of delirium, although the effect is not particularly robust. Of note, some antipsychotics are also sedating which, if timed properly, can help to promote sleep as well. Next, F is for family and friends. Involving important people in the patient's life can help them to remain engaged and cognitively stimulated. When family and friends can't be around, placing pictures of them in the room can help to create a comforting environment for the patient. Finally, E is for environment. Frequent room changes and visits from staff members can create a confusing environment that is not conducive to staying oriented. Instead, focus on keeping a calm, quiet, and consistent environment that is comfortable and easy for the patient to understand. By taking all of these steps, you are doing your due diligence to give the patient the best chance at recovery from delirium. Thanks for watching this video. I hope it was helpful. If you'd like to learn more about delirium and other psychiatric emergencies, consider picking up my book, Memorable Psychiatry, on Amazon. You can also subscribe to this channel for more videos like this. Stay well.